Welcome back to another episode of the Rankable Podcast. My name is Garrett Sussman, Demand Generation Manager at iPoll Rank, and I am super excited. Today, I am joined by Lily Baja. Uh, I totally butchered your name because I am American and you're Nigerian and you have a cool name and I can't say it properly, but Lily is an amazing content strategist at Marketing Cyborg. She's been doing content strategy for a minute, writing for major brands like WordPress and HubSpot and Zapier. Uh, basically focusing on brand generating more revenue with customer specific content optimized for search. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lily. Thank you so much for having me. Oh man, we were we were just talking about all sorts of really interesting things today all around brand equity. I'm excited to dive in, but before we even do that, tell me a little bit how you got into content strategy in the first place. Um, I got into content marketing, right? I started out as a blogger, you know, a mom blogger. <laughs> and I happened to put up a guest post on someone's site to promote, you know, to get backlinks and rank higher and promote my blog. And a lucky thing just kind of happened because it was my second guest post, actually. And a SaaS company, like a very big SaaS company, they powered as a then the, the conversion rate optimization efforts of over 700,000 sites. And then they reached out and they were like, we wanted to hire me full time from the writing that I had done. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, you can actually make make money doing this thing. And I had to, I got to try out a few um, freelance articles for them because at the time I didn't want to work full time. I don't think I ever want to work full time, actually. <laughs> so, um. Um, I realized that it was actually the kind of work that I loved. And that's how I just, I found my way here. <laughs> the rest is history. No, it's really cool because obviously you're an educator. For those of you who don't know, Lily has a YouTube channel where she teaches others about content as well, getting to write for these marketing blogs. And so today... I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of brand equity in the SERPs. So, you know, you're working with your clients and you're producing this content, you know, based on the audience personas and the keywords that they're giving you. When you're looking at the SERPs, how do you think about earning brand equity? What What's your perspective? So well, I feel like brand equity is something that lots of people ignore, right? You may be a small site and you manage to show up in the fifth position on Google for a query, maybe a very long tail keyword, right? And then someone is searching and they scroll through all the other uh, pieces of content and they got to yours and somehow yours thoroughly satisfies their search intent, it gives them... Um, content that is deep and specific to their needs. And they bookmark your article, right? And maybe tomorrow they're searching and they see your brand come up third place, fourth place, even fifth place. They skip the other articles that they see and they click on yours immediately. That's what generates um, brand awareness, um, direct clicks, like Someone has bookmarked you and they can come back to your article in future. That's what generates site search. Like on Google, I'm searching for a keyword and I only want to see results from this site. It's because you've been able to deliver, continuously deliver really good content. And that's that's just, I feel like every brand should be investing in exceptional content, if not for anything, for the sake of brand equity. So that when someone sees you, they stop in their tracks and they click. I I love that kind of perspective because then it's like every single piece that you produce has to kind of blow away your audience because that first impression really matters. So like in that context, if you're on the SERPs, it, it makes me think that your title tags, like the titles they see, the meta descriptions are super important to get the user to click on it in the first place. So I imagine you invest a ton of time in, in your titles and your meta description. What's your approach when you're creating a piece of content? Like how, how what's your process look like for the titles and meta descriptions? I do. I, I do pay a lot of attention to titles and the descriptions because that's what they see first. And if they don't know you, that has to be very promising. 
to get them to click in the first place, right? Really, it's usually two, two, three elements. The first is the keywords because obviously you have to show up in the first place. And then the second is emotion. Like what is that thing that the audience wants to achieve? Say I'm a company who sells subscription, a subscription um, platform right now. And I'm trying to target the keyword subscription business models, right? Mm -hmm. So a more generic, boring title would be the full guide to subscription business models in 2023. What's the incentive to click, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could turn it around and say subscription business models, how to create ones or how to sell ones and end forever or something. Because like mm -hmm. that is the motive, right? They want to, what is the motive behind the audience who you're targeting this post to? And then more recently, I've begun to move even further into specificity with the audience, like really calling out the audience that I want to read that piece. Because I feel like content should be for, you should either speak to me or don't speak to me. That's the way you get SEO content to convert, right? You don't need to speak to everyone. That's how I feel about it, right? And so recently I've started to do this, to inject this into the title tags as well. So um, project management, how to manage your projects better as a freelancer instead of project management or like, or how to manage your projects like for everyone. So in that sense, it becomes tricky, right? Because the more generic it is, the higher the search volume, the more people it's going to get in front of. The more specific it is, you are going for those long tail keywords, but they might be more valuable because to your point, they're right in front of the person who wants to read it. How do you balance that in terms of working with clients and either educating them on, okay, you're not going to see as much traffic, but the traffic's better versus, okay, you you might just, you might win more eyeballs in front, like at a, you know, a head term with a ton of search volume, but like no one's going to buy from you. I think the balance comes with topic clusters. This is where topic clusters completely kill it. Like you get the bofu, the mofu and the tofu just by yep. implementing the cluster. And like, I mean, if you're doing only long tail keywords and you're, you have no other place to generate traffic from, you're still losing out on like a bunch of benefits like brand awareness and all of that, just by not showing up for those top of the funnel keywords. Even though I lo love to focus on the bottom of the funnel, right? We still build it out to Mofu and Tofu, but like, the education is, this is what is going to generate you money. This is what we use to balance it. So we're not only talking to people who, well, not only being there for people when we want to take their money, we're being there for them throughout the <laughs> throughout their journey. Yeah. So when you're creating these like audience specific pieces of content, I'd imagine, especially with Google, so focused on like the EEAT factors, right? The experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. How do you get experience and expertise woven throughout these pieces so the audience that you're targeting really knows that they're the focus? The, the obvious one is quotes, and that's like what everyone does. They talk to an SME and they get quotes and they put it in the, the um, article. But I think there's something that's even more powerful, right? Is examples, mm. examples that are specific to the personnel you're writing for. So if I'm writing about project management tools, whatever examples for, for say freelancers, right? Whatever examples, whatever scenarios I paint, has to be something that a freelancer can relate to. I don't bring in um, an example of, I don't know if this is like a dumb thing to say, <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know if anyone actually does that, but like I don't bring in an example of a mom who's trying to manage her home into an article of where we're talking about freelancers. Mm, right. Right off the top of my head, I can't find a very a more specific way to put this, but this is a problem that I've seen a lot. And this is like, you know, being 
being all over the place with your examples and the scenarios you're painting such that the person that you're trying to relate to can actually see themselves in the story that you're telling. That's really interesting. It's it's almost, it's like the reverse, right? It's like your topic and your audience is very specific, but your examples need to be general enough so they don't exclude anyone in that specific audience. Uh, not really. I, I think, um, yeah, I was saying that the examples need to be specific, right? Mm-hmm. Even though they are relatable to like everyone, but you're using, let me think of an example. Mm, I'm not very good at thinking on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. As a writer, you can always like do your first draft, just get it out. Then you go back and you edit and you edit and edit until it's like perfect. No one actually knows, you know, the folks who spend all this time writing, how much goes into it because it looks so good at the end product. Yeah. That general idea is, the example you're using has to be something that the audience persona you're going after can see themselves in. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. I'm, I'm with you on that. So one other thing that's come up that you and I were kind of talking about before this is obviously the hot topic for everyone right now is AI content, right? You've got these tools that help you generate this AI content. I got to ask, are you like threatened by it? Do you like these tools? Where do you stand on it? I actually love them. I feel a little um, concerned about chat GPT and not because I feel like it's going to replace content. I'm wondering if it's going to replace Google, like, you know, users use it more yeah. than going to Google. Search. As far as quality content is concerned, AI is still like a very, very long way off. And that's because the thought processes that a writer, a really skilled writer has, AI is just not at that level yet. The expertise, AI is not at that level yet. Like AI cannot interview um, experts. They cannot bring in, uh, I, <laughs> I, I should probably mention this example. Like today I, I was using chat GPT and I gave it a prompt and was like, write out the section for me, explain the why and the how, just so it has that idea of the thought process. Like I'm literally feeding you, spoon feeding you. Um, use this, and I give it a link and I say a URL, and I say, use this um, post as inspiration. And God, it turns out fallacies. Like, <laughs> oh my God. The things that it says is completely different from like, I wish I could remember what it said, but like, it's, it's just. It was wrong. <laughs> yeah. So what recommendation do you have for, for content writers? Do you think there are ways to use it appropriately? Or do you think, are you, do you have any concerns that it's going to have a negative impact on the internet and Google search in general? I I do think it's a great tool for writers to use, especially with um, writer's block. I used to be someone who struggled a lot with writer's block, right? But now you're, you're stuck. You can just um, ask the tool. It brings out something. Even if it what it brings out is woefully wrong, you can take that. Like you get angry and like, what? This isn't right. And you take it and you see your creative juices coming back again, right? <laughs> And so it's like a help, very helpful tool for writers, in my opinion. My concern is with search. Are people going to definitely the more informational topics as these tools get better? And as they, until they stay free, like until they, they um, start charging a fee for it, obviously. Are people going to start searching for more informational stuff? on AI instead of Google. Because when they do that, search optimization kind of changes. Mm. Brands That's need so. to start optimizing to come up in, say someone asks um, an AI tool, what are the best cameras for a YouTube shoot? Brands optimization strategies will now have to shift for from optimizing for search to optimizing to like I don't even know how they, they get the answers. So like we'd have to start 
going back to the drawing board and like really it's just it's crazy if that happens and i don't think it happens it will happen because ai is currently free and it will get paid it's it's Chats very to interesting to that point of like the direction it goes in in that we're all going to have to know because there are going to be different models that are trained on different material how you can ensure that your content is some of the material that these these AI chatbots are trained on in the same way, I guess that, you know, like on TikTok as I've been reading more and more how people are using TikTok to do searches. Well, then your brand needs to be mentioned by people who content creators on TikTok, right? Like you need to find a way to get your content like into the audience or the training materials where these different platforms exist. So in that sense, how do you think brands can create like remarkable content that differentiates from all the AI content that's about to be produced and flood the internet? I think the first thing is thoroughly knowing your audience. Mm -hmm. like, I said earlier that good content is polarizing. It's yeah. spoken to one person, an audience of one, like it's, just for me and no one else, right? When content is that specific, what happens is that you have to have a strong, um, what's the word, line of thoughts to carry through, like a very strong opinion, right? Such that when someone reads, they can feel, feel something. And for me, I think creating that comes down to four things. I actually have a framework in this. <laughs> I call it the Lima framework. What is framework. it? Yeah. <laughs> I call it the, the Lima framework. And it's logical. The L is for logical. E is for explicit. M is for memorable. And A is for actionable. These are all fronts that AI is filling at today. AI doesn't have the structure to, to follow a, a, an audience, a reader's um, logical thoughts like if i want to know something what's the next question i have about this thing after you've answered the first question i have it's just I, i'm not a lawyer but i want to say it's like arguing a case in court right the reader is unconsciously probing your logic each time you say something and ai isn't at a place yet i mean lots of writers are not at a place yet where they can understand this logic like if i say this this is what the audience would next this is what comes up next in the audience's mind the other element is explicitness <laughs> and this is something that ai cannot fit right if you're using examples that are very specific to the the to, to the uh, situation you're using your own data like if i wanted to say um what's an example if i wanted to say get on podcasts, marketing podcasts. Now, this is what AI would say. Whereas being explicit in your content, you don't leave it up to guessing. Like you say, get on marketing podcasts like or SEO podcasts like Rankable and so and so and so. Because that goes back to logic. And then memorability is the part where you infuse it with stories that are relatable to your audience and analogies. And can I tell you that AI sucks at creating <laughs> analogies? I have tried it for years from, <laughs> from death bar to copy AI. I mean, I found an analogy creator tool on copy AI. I hope Chris doesn't hear this. And, <laughs> and the first day I tried it, I don't know what happened, but the first day I tried it, it was really good. Like it gave me a very good analogy. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a game changer for my writing. And then I tried the second time and it's what? what? And the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time. <laughs> and but like analogies are things that help your audience be able to relate to what you're saying. By thinking about something else that they're already familiar with analogies and metaphors, right? Yeah. And then the stories that you inf infuse in it, all these things make it memorable. I can remember it because it made me feel something. I can remember it because I have something to remember it by. There was, there was this story that 
they said it's like me talking about how I wanted to to be a blogger because of my baby. People remember the podcast and they're like, it was Lily said she wanted to be a blogger because of her baby, right? It just makes it more memorable. And then the final key is actionability because everyone reads content because they want to take action. They want to do something. There's something that needs to be solved. Right now, AI content is at a zero as long as actionability is concerned. It just tells you do this and do this and do this. How the hell do I do it, right? Right. If you you tell me to do something, I want to see how. Show me how. Get into the tool and show me how. Show me where I need to click. Exactly. Show me what I need to have to do this. AI is not at that place yet. No this way. is how brands can separate themselves. Oh, man, that, that framework makes so much sense to me. Like each step from like the logical, explicit, memorable, actionable, like especially the memorable really resonates with me, like the whole idea of the analogies. And it makes sense that AI wouldn't be able to do that yet because it's not like AI understands what it's producing. It's just kind of predicting what the next word is going to be based on what it's trained on. I, is there anywhere, have you written up about, about your framework that, that anyone can find that? Yeah, I have it on, um, I have the beginning of it. I'm supposed to release the next uh, part, the actionability part of it. <laughs> That's awesome. Next. You'll have to let us know so we can include the link in the show notes so people can find it and read about it um, after they listen to this episode. But Oh man, this is this is really cool stuff. I I love the direction that the conversation went in, but I'm ready to ask you some rapid fire rankings. Are you ready for that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, we'll turn on the music and do the time, and we are going to do some rapid fire rankings. And so, first off, Lily. Rank your top three of something, absolutely anything that you love. Um, I love nature. I love, I love being in sand and grass and water. I love notebooks because like I'm crazy about writing all the time. And um, a face, you're good, Thank <laughs> you. You could, you could, you could make me sell my soul for a yoga cafe. Ah, <laughs> uh, preaching. I, I I I love it as well. It's like in my whole like Twitter persona. Rank rank your best SEO or marketing win. Um, so this is a small win. It happened recently. Is we had a client had very limited budget for a keyword that had to do with um data, right and. Everything that was ranking was original reports, original research, and these were sites like Conferry and government sites, and we have like half the DA of the sites, right? And I'm like, we can't actually compete right now with the blog post. We need a report. And they're like, we don't actually have the project for a report right now. And so I go and I I take the data from all of the sites that I rank in and I aggregate them. And I try my best to give them insights that are memorable, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like some of the stats I try to use, um, there's a specific one I remember. It said something about 80 something million shots, shot page or something. And I'm like, that is about the size of the Turkish population or something. Just something that people could relate to, right? Mm-hmm. And I infuse it with images also because graphs, because if someone's looking for starts, they just want to see the, those visuals. And a week later, a month later, sorry, the article hasn't crossed mm-hmm. the second page. <laughs> but those images were like, they took over the complete, the entire graph. and. Three months later, that article is at number two, like Conferry and government sites and everything. It was a very good experiment and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Image SEO is what's up. Um, okay, so rank your three, top three SEO tools. Um, I really love keywords everywhere just because it's convenience to you as I browse every day. I love SEMrush. 
I could swap for RFs sometimes, and I do swap for RFs sometimes because I prefer the um, the backlink analytics tool of RFs, but I prefer the keyword research tool so much. I feel like it's more accurate. I love using Google Trends just to make sure that the keyword I'm trying to target actually has a future, right? Another alternative right. would be blimps and exploding topics. Right, like like uh, trends like AI content. Speaking of, anyway, uh, rank your best SEO trick or tactic. Well, I have a, <laughs> I have quite a few, but um, here's one I don't use anymore. But if, if you want traffic fast, like if you want traffic really fast, the best way to get it is to steal it from sites in your industry that have a skewed traffic graph. Like sites that have the majority of their traffic come from one or two blog posts and they're like really young. These sites are like really young, but they're ranking and they're pulling in a lot of traffic for one or two articles. You know that you can totally smash that I got you. Okay, rank, rank what you love most about SEO. I uh, love that SEO compounds. You know, you do something today and it's why I also, I also love YouTube. I don't have an Instagram account. I don't have a TikTok account. I, I'm, I might have a TikTok account because I feel like it has the same searchy mm -hmm. potential, right? But it compounds, like you build something, you don't have to be on your toes all of the time. Like you can build and rest, you can sprint when you have the, the energy and then you rest and not worry that everything is gonna come crashing down. <laughs> I, lo I love that, especially evergreen content is just there for a while. Okay, rank your, what is your best learning SEO resource? Where do you learn SEO? I mean, I have a lot of places like really good mentions we're in convert your sites but i feel like the best resource any seo could have is their own site like where you get to test things where you get to break things without fear <laughs> i love that yeah you gotta experiment with your own stuff and, and that's where you learn the most uh rank the top okay this is probably the hardest question but rank the top one to three seos or marketers that you most look up to this, oh my gosh, this, this one is really tough. But I'm I'm gonna say April Dunford, just because, and I hope I'm saying the name right, just because she completely owns her industry, her, I'm not sure what the word is, but like when you think of positioning, you think of April. And that is just, that's an example of what brands should aspire to. I love Rand Fishkin for how he's transitioned from um, building up more to spark to like the opportunities he sees in this space and goes out there and creates something useful for the community. It's really admirable. I love it, um, Alida, because of her impact. Like she's really brilliant, of course. But then she's also giving back to the community. I don't think I've met anyone who gives back to the community as much as Alita does. And uh, this was a tough call, but can I can I shoot one more person? I really love one more because yeah. <laughs> Caitlin Booker, and I'm not sure what the pronunciation is, but the reason why I love her work is because I'm someone who's really really customer focused, and Caitlin is all about discovering who your ideal customer is and like what really scratches their age and all of that stuff and i feel like for seo to be successful you need to really really know who your ideal customer is i i can tell like with all the all those people are incredible and with caitlin the end she's a great follow on twitter she does a lot of that interesting psychology customer psychology mm -hmm. stuff finally rank your number one cause or charity that you want to promote um this one will have to go to the fcdc that is um the Freelance Coalition for Developing Countries. It's my friend Chima Major is the founder, and she's an incredible woman who is building something that freelancers from marketers from developing countries and also the, the entire marketing world needs because diversity is 
a very, very, I think the word is potent. Like it's very, very important. You can't sell to people if you don't really know them. And then having all these diverse um, ideas and talks makes it possible to be able to reach everybody as a brand. And this is what Chima is bringing. She's, you know, helping people um, on their privileged backgrounds upskill and not just upskill, like she's supporting them. And I think the last cohort, um, tech SEO cohort she ran with Aleda Solis, all the tech SEO um, students got into um, internships with like really cool brands. That, that is something we need to see more of. It's 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 an it's such an important and incredible organization. I mean, she walks the walk. Respect the heck out of uh, Chima. Our own uh, founder, Mike King, had given a speech at one of the FTCD uh, presentations, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I just I just appreciate her. She's fantastic. I actually had her both on this podcast as well as a, uh, another podcast I had like three years ago when she was really like kind of establishing her presence in our community. And between her and Aleda, have just been such an important presence and. I think the other big thing is representation, right? Like with Shima and with all these these folks that just when you have people who are successful, you can say, oh, I can do that. I can be that, which is- 100%. Lily, this has been such a pleasure. I'm so glad that we've had this conversation. If someone wants to find you online or hire you, what's the, what's the best way to get in touch? Um, you can visit my website, lilybarger.com. And just to stay um, on top of content marketing and all that stuff, you can sign up to my newsletter at marketingcyborg.com. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much for being my guest. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> Absolutely. My name is Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank. This has been another episode of the Rankable Podcast. We will catch you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.